of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <laughs> Hey brother, how are you? I'm fine. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, great. I was hoping that uh, I could stop getting out of focus. I hadn't had time to fix the camera. There's an adjustment I can do to keep it from getting auto-focused, you know. Yep. So how's everyone? Everybody's great. Yeah. Awesome. Great. I'm glad to hear it. So, are you enjoying the springtime down there below the hemisphere? It's uh, or in the hemisphere? down in Sydney. It's just been insane. Two days ago, it was thirty-five degrees, and yesterday, and today, it's fifteen. So oh it's, no! It's uh, up in Cairns. They're having stunning weather, but uh, here it's uh, up and down and all around. So. Is Al Gore is Al Gore walking around with signs down there? <laughs> Told you I was right, or whatever. <laughs> Not yet. No, we're having real nice weather here. Warm it's, weather? It's uh, 65, 64 degrees right now, and it's early morning. Wow. So, so do you guys go by the uh, Fahrenheit or the uh, centigrade? Well, I'd say it's the opposite. To, what do you go by? Well, the, the typical person here uses the... The Fahrenheit scale. So, if we say it's sixty-four degrees, it's Fahrenheit. Yeah, so we'd be Celsius then. Oh, because thirty-five is just uh, a heat wave. Forty is just a heat wave. So. Oh. Mm. Okay, because water boils at a hundred degrees centigrade. Yeah, and freezes at, at zero. Yeah. Yeah. So, That's very interesting. So fifteen yeah. is pretty cold. Yeah. For us. Hey, guess what? I just got up about 20, uh, 25 minutes ago, or 27 minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. Is the screen in place okay? You can, uh, yeah, is it great. covering? Yeah, it's great. great. Okay. We're on the open seas today, brother. We're in a Viking ship. Ooh, a Viking ship. This one moves as well. There's water. Yeah. And you know, one of the most dangerous things when you're a Viking is to be discovered that you're not really a pure Viking. That you're half breed. Oh, oh boy! I'm only joking. <laughs> That's sometimes the way people think today. Half breed. That was a sure song, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was. You all, you all had all that uh, good music up down there, and uh, I'm, I'm being kind when I say good music. It, it is kind of uh, scary, though. Yeah, but uh, I, we really enjoyed the Bee Gees. Yeah, you know. For years, we yeah. love the BG. Love the BGs. Oh yeah. Yeah, one of them died. That was a shame. One did, and one was in the hospital last week. Yeah, oh. with the same sort of disorder in his intestines. Yeah. Mm. So anyway, well, being Vikings and all uh, today, I hope that people don't take this too racially. But a lot of people, uh, I haven't done a, a real deep study on Vikings, but. They were uh, all over the place. I mean, you know, the Germans were the same stock, and uh, the Europeans of, uh, you know, especially the North, in the Norse. Of course, you know, people like to think about these long, hairy, bearded, uh, you know, freaky-looking people that were rather well-fed and very muscular, much like yourself. Not the freaky part. <laughs> oh, it's freaky too, mate. <laughs> but uh, and uh, you know, I, I find it interesting that people want to picture Yahusha the way their race looks. Yeah. You know, and that's a mistake, a very serious mistake to make. Right now, on the internet, especially, there's a lot of people that are 
In fact, I just received an, ear, uh, an, an email from someone who's absolutely trying to defend the fact that Yahushua was definitely a black person. And of course, white people don't want to hear that, you know, and it, it's all back and forth, you know. There's no way to know, but they always like to say that they do know. Anyway, they uh, were talking about locks of hair. Uh, the Jews today, or Yahud Yahudim today, have locks of hair. And, and he's quoting the Midbar, which is Judges chapter 6, where it talks about the, you know, the, the birth of, um, who is it? Um, speak to the, when a man, oh, it's talking about the, the Midbar, yeah, he's talking about the Nazarite vow. Now, the Nazarites are not the same person as the, as the, not, the people as the Nazarene. The Nazarites were not a specific per, a group of people. The Nazarite vow was something that anyone could do while the temple was standing. And, of course, there was a, no temple back then either. But if you separate yourself from strong wine and drink for a period of time, and you also have certain other prohibited things like cutting your hair, you can't cut your hair during the term of the vow, and you can prescribe how long that vow will be for. But that's the Nazir vow, uh, and it is not the same letter components as Nazarene Naz or Nazir. Was this, uh, was this something Yahushua, uh, Yahua Institute, or is this, was this a pagan thing? No, it uh, was actually a, a thing that started, you know, long, long ago, the, the Nazir vow. Uh, you know, remember when Shem Shem, they call Samson, and his parents were uh, praying for a child, and, and, and Samson, we'll call him that because people recognize that, Shem Shem was his name. Anyway, he, uh, they, they uh, were told by Yahuwah that he is to be separate. <laughs> yeah, he's to be separate. Shem Shem. Shem Shem. Like uh, Rekob Shem Shem. Yeah. Sesame Street. Yeah. You ever watch that? Uh, I don't remember that name. Well, Shem Shem is, uh, you know, is the, the word in Hebrew for sesame. You know, oh. it's the same. Yeah. Uh, open Shem Shem. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was uh, not pagan. Now, people can probably find pagan roots because pagans did this and pagans did that, so they put it together. But, <clears throat> you know, pagans did a lot of things, and they probably did a lot of things that, that were kosher, you know, th things that were proper, but then they misapplied them to the worship of uh, false Elohim that don't exist. What was the purpose of Yahuwah um, instituting uh, uh, the Nazarite vows and things like that? Was that something that was for the old temple system? or is? Oh, it was going on all the way back as far as, you know, in history, all the way back to and Yahuwah spoke to Moshe. Oh, this is Moshe. He's uh, he's explaining to Moshe, saying, "Speak to the children of Israel and say, say to them, when a man or woman does separate by making a vow of a Nazirite or a Nazir to be separated to Yahuwah, he separates himself from wine and strong drink. He drinks neither vinegar of wine nor vinegar of strong drink. Neither does he drink any grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation." He does not eat whether it is made of the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow, his separation, a razor does not come upon his head until the days are completed for which he does separate himself to Yahuwah. He is set apart, and he shall let the locks of his hair, of his head, grow long. Anyway, the uh, person that wrote this email is using that text to say, do the present Yahudim have locks of hair. What kind of people have locks of hair? And of course, they're referring to uh, the uh, African tribes, you know, and the uh, people of uh, the Rastafarian persuasion, uh, you know, the Jamaican believers and, uh, you know, Rastafari as the Messiah. But uh, here's the deal. The word lock or lock of hair is phrase. Uh, can apply to many, many, many things. And usually it was any any person that that wanted to cut off a lock of hair, which was actually a, 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 a technique used in witchcraft. Mm. 
you know, cutting someone's lock of hair. In other yeah. words, some of the ingredients for some of their little uh, spells, yeah. they had to have certain ingredients, and they would have to snip off a lock of hair from the individual that they're trying to hurt or help. So, anyway, when that happens, in fact, when when I was very young, I remember going through some old uh, memento books, picture books, and things of my uh, parents' generation and beyond that. And sometimes you'd see a little lock of hair, you know. But to say that it had to be braided in a particular way, because see, a lot of the African people uh, who are probably watching this are absolutely being convinced that, that the Yahudim and the Israelites in general were black only, you know. They were coming out from a mix, a mixture of nations. There was a, a very vast mixture of nations. It said they came out of Mitzrayim or Egypt in a mixed multitude because there were other enslaved peoples, you know, and many of those were probably black too mm -hmm. a, as well. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> Yahusha absolutely abhors people who judge racially because when you do that, you're judging the, the maker because the same per, the same creator that created white people, black people, oriental people, whatever mixture you want to talk about, you're uh, you're judging the potter. And I remember in a text, I forget exactly where it is, but it's uh, Miriam, your Moshe's sister, criticized Moshe for marrying an Ethiopian girl. Uh, I think it was an Ethiopian girl. Uh, Rastafarian, probably. Rastafarianism didn't exist until the 1960s. But the uh, fact that she was an Ethiopian and had a racial difference from Moshe himself, Miriam, his sister, criticized Moshe for that. And it caused her to become leprous. You know, her skin turned white. And of course, that's another thing that people talk about. Well, white skin is a leper. Those Vikings, they're all, they're all lepers. <laughs> well, you know, it's just so uh, racially uh, inflammable, you know. And I, I was raised in a household where there were a lot of racial slurs going back and forth. And as a young child, I was going, whoa, what did they do to them? What, you know, why are my parents and my other relatives so, ex so extremely angry at these other races? You know, whatever they are. It could have been the Yahudim. It was, oh boy, I was hearing this. I didn't say anything. I was, what? what did they do? You know, and they had done nothing, you know. And uh, so anyway, I don't know. And I never really rubbed off on me. I was always kind of suspicious anyway. I wanted to know what was going on. And that's why I think I wrote the book Fossilized Customs. I just wanted to know, you know, you who had wired me that way. Like, find out what's going on. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, biology was a, a extreme, avid interest of mine for many, many years, and still is. I just want to know how things tick. Of course, I'll never know that, but I'm interested in uh, genetic traits and when they're switched on and when they're switched off, you know, and where they come from. And if you don't have the genetic trait, it means that you lost it somewhere along the line. Not you, but your generations. If you don't have dark skin, it's because you've lost the trait. It's not even in your genes. And it's not because you're pure. It's because you're actually uh, some breed that has been, it's been bred out of you. Because you can only remove information. You can't add back information. You know, you can do it in your offspring, but you're, you still lost it. And then you, your offspring can add it back. So, you know. I just I don't I don't know how we get up on the ratio. I guess because we're around all this Viking activity, you know. Well, I think of it. Um, last week when I was trying to put the scriptures up on the screen while you were reading them, I couldn't oh. I couldn't find the version you were using. It's not the Basor and it's not the ISR. What are you reading from? Well, that's a good question. It looks like the ISR in this case. I might have been using the AVS. And I have to correct, when I read a text from another, like a King James or a, um, well, whatever the, the, the translation is, I replace the name where it's supposed to be when I see it. If they put L-O-R-D there in all caps, and I know to say Yahuwah, 
but that was probably the AVS version. I've got all of them. I've got Ryrie and NIV and uh, just a whole bunch of them that that I uh, have on the shelf. But I only have a few in my uh, electronic version. Esword is where you can get all the translations, and I haven't uh, delved into all of those yet. I'd love to, but the uh, Esword, E dash Sword, or Esword, you can go on the internet and get that downloaded into your into your computer for free. So you don't have to have all the paper books. I have some of the research that I do. I have to go back and do deep research on the Hebrew. So I have a big, thick Hebrew version. And I have a nice concordance that I can look up each, each Hebrew word up in. So you have a big Hebrew concordance there? Well, it's actually the, the one that I use the most for doing research isn't the Strong's, although it does use the Strong's number system. The Strong's is based on the King James Version. That's what it comes from. So someone from the King James Persuasion, which because it's so popular, they made the Strong's, or Strong made it. He uh, d uses the King James Version as the basis. And uh, the one that I use is the New American Standard. It's a big, thick, you know, huge book. And it's got a dictionary in the back for Hebrew and a dictionary in the back for Greek. I don't spend a lot of time in the Greek, but I, I do sometimes, but not very often. Most of the time I'm looking up that Hebrew spelling because they really show you the spelling. Now, the, the Strong's version is used on the ESOR program, naturally, because they start, they give you the... The first download that Strong as the ESOR gives you is the King James version, and then it includes the concordance numbers and definitions that are in the Strong's concordance. And you just have to realize that there's some of the words that are spelled incorrectly in the Hebrew because they don't give you the complete spelling; they just give you one or two Hebrew spellings or so. And some of the words in the in the concordance are going to give you the prefixes and suffix, suffix, suffixes. Like it isn't going to necessarily show you the plurality, you know. So that's why I have that. <clears throat> but the uh, eSword is a wonderful resource. Everyone that does research or even studies at all, everybody should study. You really need that if you can get it. And, well, just download it. It's free. <clears throat> So www.esword, is it? I believe it is. Just If you just go to Google and just put in esword, you're going to get the correct site to go to. And after you've downloaded that, you can add different translations, like the ISR version, the scriptures, yeah, and then uh, add whatever else you'd like. There's a whole list that you can choose from. You may have to go to ISR's website to actually get a link to download the uh, ISR. I didn't see ISR's, the scriptures, in the list on eSword. So you have to go to ISR to find that link. Messianic, uh, what is it? I forget their address. But just look up Institute for, for, for Scripture Research, and you'll find it. Great. Do you have that on your computer? I have the ISR version on my computer, yes, and uh, I'm, I've been meaning to get the Basura download that too, but I haven't got around to it yet. I've had the ISR one on the computer for years now. So. <coughs> Excellent. And we're familiar with that because that's when we, when we first found fossilized and everything we found, the scriptures as well, mm -hmm. so the ISR, so we went through the definitions in the back and... Well, you know, that's my favorite. The Messiah within and the Darnell and all those, that was brilliant. Oh, yes. Explaining it all. <laughs> and uh, some of the English words are spelled differently in the Northern Hemisphere and Europe and the United States. I guess you noticed that. Yeah. You might think we're misspelling some things, but we're trying to correct the spelling we find. <laughs> But only for us, you know, it's not anything. I, I, I understand the words, but. <clears throat> uh, had a busy week, brother? 
I have. I think that might be why I slept in. Uh, I I was I woke up at like seven thirty three. Yeah. A.M. Yes. And I went. Oh, I have to be on uh, sitting in front of my computer by eight. So, this is my first cup of coffee. Yes. Just what does it say? Oh, it said. Oh, this is awesome. Phyllis is uh, want me to mention. This is the uh, mug, the coffee mugs, with the disciples' prayer, as we call it. They uh, they usually call it the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, and it's got the Paleo Hebrew, who is in the heavens. And then, uh, permit your name to be set apart, and your reign to come, and your desire to be done. We ask this in the name of Yahusha, and that's a shortened version of it. It's not the whole prayer, but it's certainly yeah. that's wonderful. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Ah. Pam puts these out. Uh, you know, yep. Pam Stanford. Yes, yes. Have you have you got any of these? Not those ones. We've got some. Uh, we just took the step about a month, six weeks ago, and got some uh, neem. It was it wasn't long after she did that radio interview, and yeah. uh, we just thought, oh my goodness, wow, let's go there, and. Yeah. Uh, so we've been using the neem, um, wash the baby in the neem. Like, yeah, it's really good. Gets rid of you know, any kind of rash or anything like that. Not that she has many, but which is interesting. I have a friend that is having a scalp condition, and I was recommending the neem shampoo, which is also usable for the whole body. But it is going to kill off any kind of you know, infections that might get into the hair or the skin anywhere. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. You just don't want to get it in your eyes, yeah. you know. In fact, Amy, Amy told me to go and spray some of the thing on the flowers to get rid of the snails instead of putting the, the snail pellets in there, which are poison. Um, mm -hmm. I want you to spray some of the neem on it because it reckons it keeps parasites away. I think it's worth a try. Exactly. It's anti-parasitic, yes. Yeah, and anyway, my friend was paying $300 <clears throat> for some shampoo, three hundred dollars wow. from the pharmacy. You know, his doctor prescribed him, and the, of course, uh, I told him that he could pick up a bottle of neem for under thirty dollars. Yeah, you know, Man. but I'm going to try to get a bottle to him because he seems like you know how doctors are. They want you to, once you start something, you're on it for life. Mm. In some yeah. cases, yeah. and uh, it looks like they they're. I mean, three hundred dollar bottle of shampoo. Uh, it, it, he needs to have something that's going to be better, safer. And uh, they were sticking needles into his skull. He could hear the crunching sounds, and you know, he. It's just re doctors have some strange ideas. <laughs> <They're> barbarians. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, well, they're probably derived from these Vulcans. I mean, not Vulcans, Vikings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a different <laughs> planet. Yeah, I haven't done any of the real deep research on the Vikings at all. But uh, they, the maps that I sh I sh sent one map to you, the Mediterranean was one of their places, and I understand that the Mediterranean is probably the source of them. And when they came out of the land of Israel, and then they went all over, they were basically sea oriented. So who who do we know that was a sea people? Yeah. Well, the historians call them Phoenicians because that's what Herodotus called them. But Herodotus was some Greek guy, and he was a part of a land empire, which most of the people were land empires. You know, like the Persians were land empires of people, and the Parthians were actually mostly Israelites. And that was the uh, growing empire during the time of Yahushua's birth. It was actually the Parthians were the tribes of Israel, and they had great respect for their homeland. And that's why they never attacked it. They had conquered everything over to the Mediterranean except for the land of what we call the land of Israel because that's, that's their homeland. And uh, historians are mystified by that. And the Roman Empire was quaking in its boots. And that's why they had the outposts there. That's why Pontius Pilate was there because of the Parthians. Ah. Most people don't know that. Wow. Anyway, the, the Israelite, the Israelites were a sea empire people, and they are the same people that 
Herodotus called, you know, Phoenicians. the Phoenicians. Yeah. That's a Greek. Those are two Greek words put together. Phoniki means date palm. Oh. And uh, Carthage is another city uh, that was a community of Israelites. And of course, Tarshish over in southern Spain. And outside the gates of Hercules, as they call it, the Gibraltar area, was the Atlantic Ocean. And that was the Great Sea. And that was the mysterious place. And the Israelites were just going boldly out in the, into the sea, uh, going on the, on the channels of the ocean currents, using the, ri the rivers in the ocean. That's what one of the terms for it is. I think it's in Proverbs. Or maybe it's the Eo. The oldest book in the scriptures is usually referred to as Eo or Job. You know, the oldest recorded one, you know. And uh, anyway, that uh, describes the Israelites, you know. But, uh, yeah, the Vikings have always been a mysterious group of people to also. The Phoenicians have been slippery and elusive to the historians. They don't know where they came from, really. But they are the Israelites. That When you put the math together, when you do the actual equation, you say, well, wait a minute, the Israelites were sea people. They migrated all over the oceans. They, they were not so much a land empire, but they weren't interested in conquering land. If they were, they could have very easily done that, but they were more sea-oriented. That's why you read about Shlomo or Solomon sending out ships that wouldn't return for three, three and a half years because they would circumnavigate the entire earth. They go around the southern cape of of Africa. They were uh, probably in Australia, but we don't know. I, I haven't heard anything on the uh, research or archaeological research on that, but they probably were. And they went to India and spices uh, were acquired and silk and things. Of course, there was a land road called the Silk Road, but most of the more efficient people used ships. And, of course, Brazil, as we've talked about, about before in South America, is a Hebrew word for iron. And that happens to be one of the main resources there now. And, of course, there's things found in the uh, isthmus of uh, Panama, that Panamonian area, uh, evidence of the Israelites, uh, Peru, and uh, North America and Canada. There's all sorts of artifacts. And uh, there was a spear head that was found that was it said for Yehuda and uh, of course we've got the famous Los Lunas stone yes. and it's currently in New Mexico mm. and um, they're just all over those guys probably knew that the earth wasn't flat they certainly did the uh, flat earthers were you know people like Herodotus you know that's kind of well it, it, the modern historians and big thinkers excuse him for that but uh, there were people in the Greek culture that knew that the earth was not flat you know my brain's not working right now I know who that was um, Archimedes possibly because I think he had calculated the size of the earth based upon the curve of the shadow of the earth when he saw the moon. When he looked at the moon and he saw the earth shadow, he calculated a circle and he knew the distance roughly. And he actually calculated the actual dimension the in his language very, very, very closely to what it actually is in, in terms of diameter. Yeah. How can um, Io or Job be the oldest book when Moshe wrote down the story of creation and the he wrote them down long before Job came along, didn't he? <clears throat> well, not according to the analysis. The actual book itself was written apparently before Moshe. And I know that it seems odd, but Moshe would not necessarily have learned anything from Eo, but he may have when he went to go see Yithro, or Jethro, because Jethro was a priest 
of Yehuda, and he was uh, obviously in possession of some writing. So uh, the 40 years that he spent in, uh, you know, away from Mizraim, Moshe probably learned a lot. I think he left when he was around 40, and then he was away for 40 years. So he was 80 years old before he was actually called by Yehuda in the burning bush. <clears throat> it's as I recall it, but uh, the fact is he was probably learning as well, because Yithro was probably a treasure trove of information. But Eob... <clears throat> The book of uh, yeah, the book of Eo doesn't actually say when it just talks about a man, doesn't it? Doesn't really say when he was in the picture, does it? No, it doesn't. But but most people that have studied the sequence of events uh, understand that Eo was written long before, not maybe not long before, but before Moshe, you know, went to Sinai and and yeah. was born, but. Uh, the fact that he has information in there is it, it, the truth is the truth. It was true before it was it was revealed. Um, anyway, Eo talks about creation quite a bit, and you know the early the early days. He doesn't go into the detail, but uh, <clears throat> he does glance on it. You know when he's discussing with his friends, and Yahuwah is talking to him, but. Uh, it's kind of a scary book for me. It's always been, because whenever I would think of Eob, I was thinking, oh, man, my, what, what, a, what a sad book. What a painful book. And I've always been somewhat fearful of reading it because of the sadness. But, you know, the things that the tragedies, you know. But it is a, an important book. We all should study, you know. But I wouldn't get on a you know, focus on just one thing. We probably need to study him, one seminar, and then I can learn more about, you know, what it has to, to tell us. There's... Uh, what, what, song what, song are we, what song are we going to sing there? <laughs> well, there's a lot of heartbreaking songs. Uh, <laughs> That's right. You know, you know, he lost everything. Yeah, what about that? Yeah. yeah. But it is a good book to study for spiritual warfare. I think, because it, it addresses who your real enemy is, you know, because the enemy was the one that was going to the throne. And isn't that the book where Yahuwah sees Hashatan and says, where have you been? And he so. goes, oh, I've been going up and down in the earth. In the earth? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, are you checking out the nickel uh, deposits and the diamonds? I don't know. But... Anyway, and he says, uh, what do you think of my servant, Eo? And uh, <laughs> he was a spectacular fellow. I mean, he was probably a, uh, an awesome, you know, physical presence. But he had all this wealth, all these herds, you know. And he was the most fabulously wealthy of his day. You know, he had so many possessions and servants and you know, they call them slaves, you know. Of course, I'm sure he treated his servants well. They were, they loved him, you know. If you've got a, if you are a slave, which I think a lot of us are and don't know it, and I am, because I serve Yahushua, and I serve his body. So if we don't do those things, uh, then we aren't slaves, you know, a servant. But when you love your master, uh, you know, where you'd actually give your life for your master, and you give your living every day for your master, uh, and you're not doing it for yourself because you can't keep anything, then uh, you are a servant. You're a slave. You know, I'm not afraid of being a slave. It takes a whole lot of pressure off, you know, because I know who feeds me, and I know who clothes me, and I know who puts a roof over my house, I mean, over my head. I'm not quite awake. <laughs> yeah, my master does that. Yeah. You know, Yahuwah. isn't there a story in scripture that says if you if you are freed as a slave but you want to stay in the house, you can. Is it pierce your ear or pierce your nose or something, and, and remain as a love slave or something? Yes, you can pierce. I think it's your right ear. You can uh, take an awl. An awl is a tool 
that is a long spike and it's real sharp and you can put, go up to a door and someone can probably help you put a hole at the bottom of your ear right there, and then put a ring through it and then that then you're a permanent slave forever a lifetime slave because slavery was a period of time you'd only be in servitude to work something off you know like uh, who was it okay well there's several examples in scripture of uh, a number of years that you'd have to serve someone you know and uh, you know that's that's okay you can do that yeah. so what's going on uh, in your it, did you have anything to cover today uh, other than Vikings <laughs> I, was I, gonna, I, I, was, I was just curious in what you were uh, if you progressed in your Viking thoughts but you still yet to look into that, eh? I haven't really looked into the Viking uh, thing, other than the fact that I highly suspect that the Phoenicians and the Vikings are the same, you know, and they roamed around a lot of the rivers of Europe, and, of course, the Danube is a waymark, as we know of the tribe of Dan, but uh, then there's... I don't know, those maps, If you, on the internet, if you look up Viking maps, there's going to be a, a lot of areas that the Vikings were known to be in. And they, uh, I guess the archaeologists uh, use a lot of artifacts and things. But they were obviously mixed with paganism. So they had the, the falsehoods of the Sidonians and the Tyrians. You know, Sidon and Tyre were northern cities that were, you know, kingdoms, and they were in northern Israel, and they were influencing the Israelites, and when they would go out on ships, a lot of times the, the crew would be part Sidonian or Tyrian and Israelite. They would have just mixtures of people, and they when they left, they would go to long, far away places that were great distances and set up settlements and some of the people were permanent fixtures there. They never left again. They didn't come back on the ship. They just stayed behind and continued work. And then when the ship would come back some three years later, then they would give them the, the they would get supplies and they would also probably do some exchanging for their work, you know. So but they were a mixture, and that's why we have all this sun worship all over, like the Mayans and the Aztecs in Central and South America. Yeah. And uh, they were Israelites, but they were also influenced by these religions, the Tyrians and the Sidoni. So they had this sun worship deal, and the pyramids and obelisks and all that. Mm. Yeah. You were, um, so, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were talking about Abraham before, and um, as we know, the um, Abraham's first son, Ishmael, was the he was where the nation of uh, the religion of Islam comes from, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Uh, well, the, not so much the religion, because the the Ishmaelites were just put out. The Ishmael and his and his mother Rakab, or not Rakab. <laughs> Hagar was put out of the house because you know Abraham's wife just didn't want to be around con that contentious woman, you know, because she was always having trouble with her. Uh, she was her servant, but she wouldn't uh, treat her with respect. Mm -hmm. She felt better. So this Egyptian woman, Hagar, was put out and son Ishmael, but that wasn't when the religion or the system of faith of Islam started. This, this, this started long, long after. So when, uh, when we encounter the early, um, the earliest remnants of Islam, we have to go back to a man named Muhammad. And Muhammad had encountered this person that was actually, as we know, a Roman Catholic nun, Khadijah, or Khadijah, and uh, he had learned some things, but he had a physical condition. They say that they suspect that he was an epileptic. You know, he had epilepsy. And when he would 
go into one of his f uh, fits or whatever, they would have to roll him in a carpet. They'd roll him up to keep him from hurting himself, and then he would come out of it, and, and either during or after, they would write down what he, what he said, because he was talking very strangely about things that he was seeing or experiencing when he was under the influence of the, of the seizure, you know. And that seizure was a, uh, a, a source of pain for Muhammad, too. He thought that maybe he was demonically possessed. And he couldn't explain it. In fact, uh, uh, some of the books that I've read about him explain that he tried to commit suicide once, but uh, that, that's a, you know, before he was Islamic, you know. Uh, anyway, Islam developed, and then... Uh, it means submission, and he studied a lot of other religions. Obviously, he was because a lot of the things that Islamic people do are processes that come from here and there, just like Catholicism. There's a, a great mixture of blending, you know. But Muhammad's family was the hospitality tribe for visitors to Mecca. This is before Islam, because in the Kaaba their cube, which is uh, not exactly a cube, it's a little bit different, it's, it's several feet off of being a cube, some 30, 35 feet cube. Uh, they were going around this cube with 360 things, idols inside of it. They had little statues of various deities, and the visiting family, the people would come from far and wide to walk around the object of their worship. That's what they call circumambulation, to walk around, ambulate. And that circuit, uh, that walking around, was a process of worship. And that's where we see the Shintos doing that too. The Shinto religion does the same thing with their shrines, you know. So in this shrine called the Kaaba were 360 idols. And uh, the greatest of course, to Muhammad and his family, was the little moon deity called A-L-L-A-H. And of course, that's why you hear him saying that. He's not the only, he's the greatest, you see. And uh, it's it's a little confusing. You can do your own research on that. But uh, I wanted to ask you, because um, last week I was uh, referring to Todd's last chapter in the Messiah book, and one aspect I didn't get to touch on last week was because um, uh, he, he was talking about the three main religions that use uh, a form of belief in Yahusha or the Messiah and the scripture and of course you have the Christians and you've got uh, the Yahudim or Judaism and then you've got the Muslims who also use heavily use the scripture as well so he's referring to them and um, he says um, at the same time, this is after he talks about Christians and, and, and Judaism, he says, at the same time we see the religion of Islam, which claims to believe the Hebrew scriptures as well as the Quran. One of the pillars of the Islamic faith, faith is that there is no G-O-D but A-L-L-A-H, and Muhammad is his prophet. This is a clear, contradic mm. this is a clear contradiction with the Hebrew scriptures which profess that Yahuwah is Elohim. This is not the only contradiction in Islam. Muhammad actually contradicted himself as he progressed through his life. Early on he was friendly towards the Jews and the Christians and this is reflected in his writings when he was in Mecca. He actually referred to Jews and Christians as people of the book. Later in his life when he failed to convert the Jews and Christians he grew more hostile towards them and we see that hostility reflected in his writings from Medina. This is why we currently see Muslims claiming that Islam is a religion of peace. They are quoting from Muhammad in Mecca. At the same time, we see Muslims declaring jihad and justifying every sort of killing in, of infidels. They are quoting from Muhammad in Medina. Since his words from Medina were spoken later in his life, they are considered to supersede his earlier statements. Therefore, it is difficult to consider Islam a religion of peace when the latter words of Muhammad promote violence. And he's talking about, I wanted to tie in with what you said last week about, um, you were saying that the minute we see 
uh, a messiah of some sort set themselves up in the in Jerusalem and declare themselves as um, as Elohim, I guess. You were saying that that's that's when the clock starts ticking. To more them. than likely, yeah, yeah. Like. So, and uh, I, I mentioned that to Chris during the week about because I cause remember last week I asked you would that be like a like a, a king or a president or would that be like a pope and you said well it's more than likely the the, 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 the what Rome is doing now if it moves over to Jerusalem that would be the key and. After reading this, Chris said to me, ask Lou about this because he says, interestingly, Muslims believe that J-E-S-U-S will return in the future at Damascus. They believe when he returns, he will perform all of the prayers of a faithful Muslim. He will institute Islamic law according to the Quran and he will abolish all other religions and tell Christians to convert to Islam. He will deny that he was Elohim or the son of Elohim. He will simply be A-L-L-A-H's slave and messenger. He will kill the Muslim Antichrist, get married, have children and die. He will then be buried next to the Prophet Muhammad. So while Muslims believe in J-E-S-U-S and his return to earth, they do not see him as the Messiah. In fact, they believe that he will submit to Iman Mahdi, the Muslim Messiah. So my question is, do you think maybe rather than coming at it from the Roman perspective, it could come from the Muslim perspective. If somebody is setting themselves up in Jerusalem as the... Do you think it could be from that angle? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And there's been... Uh, they, originally, the papacy wanted to move into Jerusalem by means of the Islamic religion, eradicating their competition. And there was an agreement set up that when they did so, that the Pope would move in, and then when that happened, uh, when they when the Islamic hordes or invaders wiped out the people that were in the land, then they went back on their agreement and didn't let the Pope move, and that was really the germ or the seed for the Crusades, and uh, every you know Hashatad wants to set himself up in Jerusalem by whatever means. So, you know, the, the, the religions are all at each other's throats, and that's sad, because um, the creator that made us doesn't want to see us bickering and fighting over each, against each other. He wants to see teamwork and unity. And, uh, of course, we use different words, but Islam is not an evil word. It's actually a good word. It means to submit. And... Muslim comes from that word, you know, that's a derivative of the word Islam. But uh, it's actually a good thing to submit to the Creator. It's just which Creator? You know, the, the uh, being that, the well, the being or idea of a person that the Islamic people think that they're serving is, is changing all the time in his own writings. Uh, and they excuse that. They say, well, you know, the, the, this being can change his mind and, and keep, these are the contradictions that people see. And they, uh, you know, it's just a confusing thing to have a, a being that, you, you know, is likely to change his mind one minute. And they don't really feel loved by the being, they just feel like they're his slaves, you know. And we have a relationship with the true creator that revealed his name as Yahuwah, when A-L-L-A-H isn't so much a name, it's just a, a title. And the Islamic people know this. They don't seem to have a problem with not knowing the actual personal name. It's just a, 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 a word that's derived from the Hebrew word Elah. Or, you know, Elah is the term we hear in El or Elohim. But it's not a personal name, you know. The uh, sorry, the Indonesian the Indonesian scriptures have A L L A H instead of like we would have Lord or G O D. Their scriptures have A L L A H for the Creator. Mm -hmm. Oh, in, the, in in place of the word Elohim. Mm. Yeah. Well, that that is uh, just a, a use of the language of the letters, and it isn't a name, so. 
it's um, not a personal name. It's it's actually a pronoun. It's what he is. Elohim, uh, A L L A H, is a suitable alternative. But uh, for not a name, but you know, for the term that we use, Elohim. Elohim means plural, doesn't it? Too. Isn't well, that's plural? a confusing thing. I'm glad you brought that up. There's a lot of people that are Christians look up the word Elohim and they see that it means a plurality because the I or the Yod Mem ending in indicates such. However, so does the ending O T H, oath. Now, when you look at uh, certain words in Hebrew, when you're talking about an entity or a person or the character of something that is huge, let's say in size and or power, then you use a plural ending. You wouldn't use a plural ending um, for something that wasn't large in scope or power uh, for something that's small. But you would do that with certain things. So if a person, like in the scriptures it says people themselves, can be Elohim, or referred to as Elohim. And the uh, sons of Elohim, you know, uh, are the, the spatial beings. But uh, if you have a great person, a mighty person, then the, you could, uh, in, the, in that day, they ascribe the term Elohim to the person because of their, their mightiness. Mighty, mighty. And it was only one person. And, uh, the, but Yahuwah is, is great and mighty in, in power and his immense scope of reality and existence. So it's typical to use a plural ending on a word like that. Now let me give you another example because the, the creature that's described or the beast, behema, a behema is a large creature as we know, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be large because a behema could be a small creature. Uh, we see the word behema in the scriptures and we instantly think it's huge. Uh, but if you use the plural ending, it is a single creature, but it is huge. Behemoth, the O-T-H, gives it that plur a plur plural ending. But it's only one creature, but it implies that it is huge. What see? is that creature? Well, that's a good question. Where is it? Where is that? I get maybe a uh, sea creature, possibly. Uh, there was, uh, you know. Where, is, where does it refer to? It? I, I think the Book of Eo. Okay. Yeah, the Book of Eo describes them, and then uh, the Psalms, and no doubt Proverbs probably has it. I haven't really done a study on where the word is used. However, the word plur the plurality of a word can be used as a plural, but it can also be, uh, how they wind up with just three, though, is interesting, because Yahuwah is not three. If he were three, he would have said, um, you know, hero Yisrael. Who is three? Yahuwah is three, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or four, or two. So we do have our problems. But uh, the one that knows how many he is, no, we know him. But... Uh, it isn't really so much a them, you know. Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's what, you know. And uh, it, 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 we have, you know, the need to understand that, you know, Yahushua was speaking to someone, but he was speaking for their benefit, and he said so, you know. Yeah. So it, it, prayer and relationship with Yahuwah is important. He wanted us to know that. So do you think uh, if they were, he was just praying for their benefit, do you think he was conscious? So, you don't, so all the times that he would go off and pray, do you think he yeah. was actually referring to, to another being or do you think he actually had the, well, I know he had the fullness of Elohim in him, but yeah. does that mean he wasn't actually talking to anybody the whole time? Did he, would he have known in his physicalness that, that and why, why, in the garden when he would pray with the father, no one was watching him. And, um. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a really interesting he thought can do process. Anything. <laughs> he could do anything he wants, but, you know, when he 
was in the body that he was in, and he's in it now. That it's resurrected and and it's not. It doesn't have the curse of, you know, the the de degrading second law of thermodynamics and all that. You know, his body's not dying like ours is. See, we understand that sin is a. Um, a, 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 a terrible thing to do, and it's rebellious, and it causes us to have what we call leprosy. You know, leprosy is a degradation of the uh, flesh. So the flesh dies, and as that process ensues, the body starts changing and aging and getting weaker and older and succumbs to more things, you know, the pressures of the world and the universe. So it, 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 there's an end point for us. But now Yahushua doesn't have an end point now. He did have an end point, and then he resurrected. And he resurrected himself, it says. He raised his own body up by the power and authority that was given to him. It was given to him because he was the Son. He is the Son. The Son is the body that they could they could go up to and touch and see. That's the Son. And when he comes back, we'll see him as he is. And we'll be like him in the in the same way. But he's gonna go he's his plan is to inhabit us fully, just as he inhabited himself or inhabits himself. So it's really gonna be a serious hive mind going on. We're going to be, he's going to be in many, many people. And we'll just be there and go, oh, we'll, we'll also be there. So I guess we'll have a sort of a, a schizophrenic personality because we'll be there and he'll be there too. And he'll be in charge. So schizophrenia on steroids. <laughs> you know. On acid. <laughs> in fact, that's one of our problems right now. We keep wanting to steer and control our lives when we really aren't in control of anything. Right. We just think we are. You know, when I put, uh, you know, a, a, a computer on my desk and plug everything together, you know, I really know when I'm not in control because it, the computer does what it wants to do. You know, it hardly ever obeys me. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever feel that way sometimes? Uh, I like used, fight this thing? I, when I was, a few years ago, I had a fit of rage and I actually threw a computer out the door. <laughs> oh, back yeah. Before, back when I was into a lot of rage. <laughs> yeah? You had a lot of rage? Yeah. I was just so fed up with the computer, I threw it out the door. <laughs> I've had my, uh, yeah. I had one piece of electronic equipment yeah. that I actually felt hatred for. And I launched it into the river. I <laughs> went up on a big, tall bridge, and I pitched this thing off the river. This was back when we were, I was a teenager. Sure. It was, it was yesterday. <laughs> oh, this thing was a, a terrible piece of equipment. It was an amplifier, and we used it for uh, our vocals in the music group. You know, And the amplifier was constantly giving us trouble. It would, warm, it would get hot, and then it would not work, and then it would cool down, and then it would start working, you know. And it was back when they used tubes, you know, because yeah. I come from that that long ago. And uh, we replaced the tubes, and then it would do the same thing. It was very frustrating. So we ended its life. <laughs> <laughs> you just uploaded the entire... Well, I don't know how you managed it, but the witchcraft seminar? Witchcraft, that was good. That was amazing. Yeah, that was a, a, a wonderful study. And I don't touch on every little thing that's witchcraft. I mean, we it's just to basically get people to think about things and investigate. Because some of the things that didn't look like witchcraft to me, even though I was in the faith, uh, I didn't identify them as witchcraft. You know, like the cutting of the red ribbon at the door and all that. I didn't know where that came from. You know, but it's witchcraft. We had a witch comment on there today. In your salon? Uh, no, no. A witch commented on the uh, part one of the witchcraft today. Oh. There's a comment there from a witch. And we have something wrong, maybe? Yeah, she's, you're off your face. 
we're off. You don't know uh, what you're talking about. Well, Do some real research, Lou. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the uh, within the witchcraft community and Satanist community and all those, they they argue among themselves about all kinds of things. So don't worry about that. If, if, if they aren't all on the same page. In fact, it's you funny. Know, I, I, I hang around with a lot of them. Yeah. You know. But uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about that because <laughs> our research is going to our other witch and Satanists and things. That, that, well, you know, Satanists say, "Well, we're not, we're not them," and and uh, witches say, "Well, we're not Satanists." You know, well, they don't know what they worship. You know, yeah. they really don't. They they claim to to know, but they do worship the Earth Mother or the Moon Deity, uh, one or the other, and that's you know. The uh, A S H E R A H is central to their system. In fact, the cone head is actually what that is. It's a A S H E R A H, the cone of power itself. And when they get a, a group of them together into a huge cone of power, they can really get the vortex going. But they put all their witch hats in a circle or whatever, you know, like that's going to help, you know, <laughs> whatever. Do you get a lot of um, reality TV shows over there? Well, you know, I haven't watched television as television for decades. Uh, but Phyllis and I do rent some actual episodes of of uh, TV episodes, you know, good ones. Some of them were made in UK and, you know, uh, some of the interesting ones here. She likes detective uh, type things. And I do too. I enjoy uh, mysteries and, and detective shows. And the TV things are not that bad in language. The movies can be. Movies can have some pretty bad language, and uh, we do watch a few R's, but uh, R rated, but not many. Uh, I try to not. But uh, we follow a lot of different actors, yeah. you know, in their movies. You know, yeah. I like John Cleese. Yeah, he's a real fun guy. Oh boy. Yeah. Anyway, I was just going to say that uh, there's a reality show on now. I don't just watch it. It's called The One, and because uh, they're doing all over here in Australia, they're doing reality TV on everything. There's people on Lost on Islands. There's people in great races around the world. There's master the people cooking reality shows. People in well, now they've got one an Australian, Australian Idol, American Idol, where the the music trying to find a star. Well, this one's called The One, and it's trying to find Australia's best psychic. And so they put all these group of, there's about a dozen of them psychics to the test. They'll have a whole car park, whole car park full of people, whole car park full of people, and they're going to try and guess where which, per, which car's got the person lying in the trunk and all this sort of thing. And, of course, they find him. And so I'm looking at Amy because it was a commercial. And I said to Amy, they're trying to give credibility to psychics, uh, which, which I give credibility. I, I, I agree that I have no problem saying they're true and what they're hearing is true. It's just a matter of the fact that it's, it's wicked. It's abomination. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So uh, we'll have to see more and more of that, I'm sure, you know, justifying it and trying to prove people. But, uh, you know, it's drawing away a lot of uh, weak-minded people, you know, that are interested in following whatever they can. And as long as they can understand something that's simple, then they'll follow it, you know. But, uh, you know, Phyllis is telling me I've got a time issue yeah. today, so I'm going to have to cut it off. But uh, That's fine. I hope you have something here you can use today. <laughs> and uh, people don't feel like we're wasting their time too much. But, uh, you know, uh, but I will see you next week. And I wanted to commend you on the work that you've done on the on the late, uh, latest songs, both of them, that one that you and Amy made together. Yeah. You know, that's really good. Kneel at his throne. Yeah. And that's what I want to do. I want to kneel at his throne. Yeah. Isn't that going to be the day? Oh, can't wait. Yeah, people, uh, he's just uh, remade a song called Kneel at His Throne, yeah. and it is a wonderful song. It's bluesy, you know. Yeah. It is now. 
Yeah? Well, I haven't heard the... If you've changed it, I haven't heard it. No, no, you, I meant what Adam did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 That was pretty did you cool. hear it? Did you yeah. hear it slow it down a little? Yeah. That's pretty cool. It is. Mm. And it, it was fine. It was, it was fine. Yeah. But I'm going to have to have to slide. I'm going to have to boogie, you know. You have a lovely day, mate. You too. And we love you. And yep. we love all of you. So we'll see you yep. later on. Yep. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Okay.